Hey everyone, hope all is well. My name is Miles Dyer and welcome to the quest for global empathy. For about eight years now, it has been my dream to launch my very own podcast show, but getting the resources together and having a focus point of how to go about it has taken a long time. But thanks to Creators for Change, a YouTube initiative that aims to unite content creators from all across the world with dealing with issues of extremism, xenophobia and racism, it has finally been possible to do it. Um, they have allowed me to fund four episodes, which I will be releasing. Uh, and then after that, it's all down to you guys. I hope that you enjoy what you see or hear, depending on what platform you consume this on. And if you would like to see more, then please check out my personal Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Miles Dyer, where you can support this podcast for as little as $1 a month. And if we hit our target, um, we'll then be able to keep making these. So thank you so much for your time and hope you enjoy today's show, where I am joined by Enter Shikari vocalist, Raul Reynolds. Raul, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Do you come to Reading often? Um, when was the last time I was in Reading? Probably for the festival. That's about the say, only time, really. I've, even though I live just outside Reading, I've only been to Reading Festival for half a day, and that was many years ago. And it was with a friend who was quite ill, so we had to leave before Foo Fighters came on. Oh, no. Really gutted. And, oh, mate. No, but it, that's like my festival. That's yeah. the one I've been to since I was 15 or something. So you went to Reading Festival as a fan of music first mm. before you then started playing there? Yeah, I think it's the only one I went to before we played festivals. Um, I think it's the definitely the only one I camped at, like for the, did the full weekend thing, and you know trolley jousting and <laughs> getting muddy and dirty and. Yeah. And when and when you went to Reading Festival, was it at a time where you were musically conscious and there was that thing of it'd be cool to play up there one day or? Yes, I I distinctly remember turning to Chris, our bassist about halfway through a hundred reasons set on the main stage middle of the day beautiful sunshine cider in hand you know arm in arm <laughs> singing along and we're like, if we can just get to that stage where we're like opening up the main stage or like first on when the sun's out because i think that's that's one of my favorite sets to to play like an early afternoon if the weather's good yeah on a, on a main stage so you can see the sky you can see the people and we were like yeah if we could just do that that'd be sick and then course we surpassed that so I'm yeah very very content that's amazing that, yeah. when I was looking at how to introduce you on the podcast I could have just gone and a shikari vocalist lead singer but I always think go to the Twitter account because people always come up with quirky ways of introducing <laughs> themselves and you're the woke pop knight yes the song right and then into shikari who said that now but... well that was my next question because <laughs> woke pop knight was that in a review or something we no someone uh, I think it was just on Twitter someone said that the new album is woke pop and I think it was a cuss and I was like cool I'm just going to make that our, our own because I love that because it's just so ridiculous um, and then it sort of actually became a, a thing and now I'm not sure if I'm still using it ironically or not right well that's I think the battle of to the, uh, today's times when it comes to discussing things online and actually in the real world if we call it that yeah. is it's about owning the narrative people are going to use any word for good or for bad yeah and so you may as well it's about owning the language yeah like reclaiming it and yeah, yeah 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 reusing yeah. it um so for Enet shikari if we go right back to the beginning what was Enet shikari's mission as a band and what has the mission become because it's been how many years now 15 uh 2003 right we yeah. started yeah um I mean, yeah. First of all, it was there was nothing grand, like there was no plan. Um, it was I always just say it was a hobby that eventually got out of hand. Um, <laughs> so we just that is definitely one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, well, like all all four of us had been in a band. Well, actually, three of us had been in a band and bands since we were about twelve, um, just playing covers. Um, and me, Chris, and Rob used to. This was about halfway through secondary school or something. So we'd come home from school. We'd then go to the slightly more expensive posher boys' school, clean that. That was like our little after-school job. Get you know, get like five quid a day or something. Um, and then we'd go and practice. And that was our. We did that three times a week. So it's like our weekly routine. So. 
and that's always like my my first when people say like ask for uh, advice for young bands and stuff just practice practice like hell so we we had like at least three or four practices every week um and so then it it really was just kind of doing it for fun with, with a with a bit of ambition starting to sneak in once we started playing gigs and we got into the local scene and our, our local scene was thriving and uh, amazing like a vast swathe of incredible bands and overall types of, of kind of alternative music really um and once we got into that i think we started not just really enjoying it but just starting to have a kind of vision um and i think that the two kind of defining things for us were uh lyrically and kind of uh what the band is just about in a very simple sense is just unity i'm um, trying to with the gigs trying to create community and with uh just our our general outlook just fighting for for unity in a world that as we all know is becoming increasingly more divisive um and then the other thing was just to make music that didn't that couldn't really be pigeonholed so um, we were very lucky as i say to be in this scene that was all sorts of music throughout the whole spectrum um and we were influenced by it all and and at time you know 15 years ago people were still like very purist in how they listen to music so you'd have the metal heads who listen to metal and think everything else is shit and you, you, yeah. you know to listen to that's not metal yeah, yeah you know to listen to dance music is blasphemy pretty much yeah um, genre snobbery growing <clears throat> up was such a big thing yeah and it goes to that thing of like all those in some ways things have become more divisive in rhetoric in other ways unification has sort of taken hold like i think people yeah. are more accepting of genres now definitely yeah. definitely there's not so much of a i think there's pros and cons to this but i think it's mainly positive that there isn't that um you know you, you sort of define your whole being by what music you listen to you know it's the it decides what clothes you wear it decides who you hang out with where you hang out almost what you some outlooks on the world and we were quite lucky because our local scene was uh, there were a lot of good hardcore bands punk bands um that gave us a sort of a sense of social justice and community and mm. things like that um so that that was important to us as well to make music that wasn't that didn't just fit into one narrow bandwidth of the the musical spectrum and you talk about <clears throat> unity and i guess that as you grew as a band the battlefield if we call it that in which you preach isn't probably the best word to use but that you promoted unity actually yeah. grew because initially it was in your local community unity mm. there and then as you're playing bigger and bigger stages you're now talking about unity on global issues yeah yeah well we almost got forced into it really <laughs> right, because yeah. like because I, I i don't come from a sort of very uh, politicized like family you know like my, my parents aren't like massively like you know social justice warriors or something like that um it was more the the first thing that got me into sort of wanting uh to provide a space that was can be used for unification um was that our local council started basically preventing or making it incredibly hard to, for us to put on gigs um and that i think gave us straight away a sense of just not trusting um you know the powers that be um and having a sort of distrust of authority um because you know th these gigs were the, the shows that we, we were involved in putting on were at our local youth club they were getting effectively getting kids off the streets and getting them out of trouble um but of course they hear the music that those in the council and they think oh you know this is obviously just drugs and violence and yeah they perceive it to coming together in which trouble is then organized yeah like organized yeah. crime and you know <laughs> of course there's the one or two occasions where like yeah. bad stuff to happen but like <laughs> you know on, on the whole it was a an amazing thing for like so you know i i am i i probably wouldn't be in this band and doing this and having this outlook if i didn't have that sort of youthful community and artistic community that, that, that we had um so th yeah, that was incredibly frustrating, but that sort of, yeah, it, it kind of led us down the path to um, wanting to not just continue fighting council and putting on these gigs, but creating a unified local scene. Cause we, we had to, we had to sort of band together to fight, to, to put these gigs on. Um, so that was a, a very small scale 
like experience of, of fighting for unity and then yeah as you say things just slowly expanded and started wanting to sing about bigger events have you had to take any fights on the bigger scale now that you're bigger in the industry that you can talk about uh, <laughs> like I've, but it might not even be that is that is has there been things where you've come against an opposition or yeah but i mean it's, it's happening all the time really. i mean it it's probably more um sporadic and spread out it's not one mm. focus point it's just the day-to-day -day conversations you're having with people online who oppose yeah. perhaps interpretations of your music or um the things that you speak about as an individual on social media uh, yeah well that there's there's pro possibly less of of that of like because i think anyone involved in what the arts in cr creative industry and everything is usually you know on some level going to be slightly left-leaning and and for the things that we're singing about so it's only we only come up against um you know a bit of kickback when it's i don't know uh, when we sort of stick up stick our heads above the 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 underground and we we venture into the mainstream world where the the views are perhaps more diverse um but i think the, the one thing that we've still fought against but on a bigger scale is just venue closures and and the lack of fu like government funding for arts and for venues and for for keeping local music scenes alive um because like you know if we look back now like all the scenes that the one that we grew up in the the little ones that we played in the home counties and then slowly moving further and further getting gig swaps with people in Cardiff and Glasgow they've, they're not there anymore they've, they've shrunk dramatically like I'm always scared is is this me just being a really ignorant out of touch old person who's like oh in my day yeah. the, you know the scene yeah. was thriving <laughs> um, but it's it, it's it is all the evidence I've seen and the, and the people that I, I try and make sure that I speak to as many people as I can in the in, in what's left of these scenes sure and they have shrunk dramatically. Um, so that's still a, a kind of, uh, that, that fight that we were having on a small scale is still there, but just on a, you know, it's now with the conservative government rather than just the conservative local council. Right, yeah, I mean, even in Reading, I think of growing up and how many gigs there were happening everywhere. And mm. Now there's a lot less and you can see certain venues that have stuck around. Um, but I think it's not, you look at sort of what has caused it to happen and I think, you know, austerity and cuts is a part of it but i also think it's the um the satirization uh, the, the the fact that the market has become more saturated in the sense yeah. of when you get invited to an event these days in a digital world you have a list of event invites on facebook or social media and you can now pick and choose a lot more easy mm. easily whereas when we were younger before the internet there was the one gig that all your friends were going to and you'd make sure you go down and I think that it's not necessarily made us more lazy, but because the choice, there is so much more choice, it means the amount of things that get turned down. And also there are more bands starting up because it's never been easier to start music. Yeah. And I wonder if that, that has, because the market has become more saturated, if it means that the opportunity for having music as a business model in the live scene, unless you are a big band, <laughs> Mm. that's one of the big challenges I mean I remember um, our band played um, a few years ago in Slough uh, just got a bit closer to London for the uh, global audiences and um, we played at a pub that used to put on gigs uh, and this was their first one in ages and what happened was it was donations at the door um, we provided all the equipment for the sound and that and they I think they said it was one of the best nights of business at the bar because obviously people come in because it's free or donation and then they spend so much at, at the bar and sort of that's a new business well it might not be a new business model in many places but that's sort of something that goes against how it traditionally was done which is you pay high prices for a ticket tickets are now going up because they're having to make up for the fact that business is doing worse yeah but actually that <clears throat> kind of model of getting people in first and then allowing them to spend drinks at the bar I think a lot of people are still trying to work out what is the best way of, of keeping the live scene alive in in that way. Yeah, I've and I've got no idea what what, what would be the answer because uh, as well with the this is kind of more of a positive I suppose, but with the advancement of technology and how cheap and easy it is to make music yeah. yourself, I think a lot of people um, who would be in bands are now just making all the music themselves on their laptop because you know recording on a. Uh, 
you know renting out a studio to record live drums in in a proper drum room is expensive whereas doing the drums on your keyboard on a, on a laptop is is really easy yeah um and and not expensive at all so i think a lot of people are now just opting for either becoming like producers um and just doing everything themselves which is amazing um but then yeah you lose the the kind of live side of things um dwindles a bit um in that respect you've but, played at a lot of places around the world like lots of different countries i mean name a few countries you've played at this you've played in japan uh yeah yeah but we're lucky enough to have, to have gone there i think we did our seventh or eighth trip there this, uh, that's amazing this year <laughs> um yeah an incredible place um we did we did a, a full of our press our, our first like proper southeastern asian tour so we going from everywhere to hong kong singapore thailand uh went to china for the first time um that was super interesting because some of those shows were just like 100 200 caps so these like you know we haven't played to audiences that small for so long so it's an amazing experience um uh, and then yeah america we're still sort of hacking away at right um it's a beast yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we haven't gone to south america that much yet we've, we did um what's a slipknots festival not fest in mexico city okay. which was which was incredible but that's the only time we've ventured there um south africa europe wow. russia yeah the reason i asked was because <clears throat> when you talk about sort of the local scenes dying if we can use that word um is that a commonality across the world in your experience obviously you haven't lived it as much in these countries but is there a sense of have you learned where lo local scenes are perhaps thriving more in some areas than others or are they all because of you know the saturation of the market are that are live seat scenes struggling um, out everywhere i think i think it is a general trend but there are again some positives that have come out of it um i think the so to take an example that in america your sort of metalcore warp tour scene i mean we're seeing warp tour on its last year this year yeah has, is dwindling a lot dwindling a lot but then i think what you're seeing are, are sort of scene local scenes that support the, where bands support each other but they sound nothing like each other um you, you see a lot of this in in california and just yeah the um, west coast of, of america in general um you know that there'll be sort of like r b groups um like perhaps you know collaborating with a, a metal band or a rock group doing stuff with hip-hop uh, acts and it's just there's a, there's a very sort of fluid just mismatch of, of all sorts of stuff going on which is which is really exciting um and makes for more exciting music i think um but i yeah in in general i, I do think there's a you know the, the scenes are sort of dying a bit but. yeah um so what i've always respected about you man is the fact that there's a lot of bands that sing and you do a, a lot of music about a lot of subjects but it's only like in the interviews and things like that you can really find out to what extent they really understand the subjects. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And you're always someone who's been very um, articulate in the fact that you have clearly researched and thought a lot about the things you do. And in 2014, you did this um, Z Day uh, talk for the Zeitgeist movement about the social value of music. 2014. Oh my yeah. God, that was so long. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Jesus. And it was it was so so impressive, and. It was really interesting hearing you talk about, you know, we all know music does us good, but you'd really gone into the research of sort of how it has an impact on our psychology and biology. And I'm not going to start testing you now on all the things, <laughs> but I just thought if you could talk a bit about it, because yeah. I think when we look at issues of unity and sort of social cohesion around the world, we look at it from a very face value perspective of we're all just people interacting and that's it. And I think... <clears throat> Some people don't like to admit it that we're all very easy to manipulate because we are biological by our very nature. Um, the words that we communicate have been told to us at some point in our life. Um, it, it gets into whole issues about free will and to, to mm -hmm. what extent we're actually free to make our own decisions without influence from our surroundings. Yeah. Um, but you talked a lot about, like, I think it was uh, oxytocin, uh, yeah. the hormone. I don't know if you just go into that a bit <laughs> of... Yeah, well, I mean that that one's especially interesting because it it sort of 
the neuroscience around that has corroborated kind of history and how musicality is so deep within us um i think often we get we sort of think that music is this skill that you um that some people have and some people don't uh which now science is is starting to say well that that's kind of shaky that's shaky ground now um it appears to be something that's i mean it the kind of the jury's still out it's not there's there's new sort of studies that are, are done all the time and it's a really interesting field at the moment um but yeah it appears to be that that music um it's it's more we know it's a, a skill that's kind of learnt, but there there are kind of base level things that everyone has um which then brings into question like whether music um came before language or musicality came before language um so you have things like so to give some context you've got like the oldest known uh human instrument is a bone flute that dates back to about 45,000 years which is a long time but to add more context to that the the first kind of um evidence of or presence of language is about 100,000 years ago um but then of course a bone flute that dates back to 45,000 years ago is just the first thing that has managed to survive. So singing and clapping, there's no evidence in the you know fossil record or whatever of, of that. So you have to expect that it goes back further than that. Um, so then you have different sort of outlooks on where uh, or how deep music runs uh, in our evolutionary advance so uh, darwin came up with the the first sort of uh idea which was that music was used for sexual selection so it's like a, you know in the same way that a peacock has a vast plumage and go look at me look at all this energy i can effectively waste yeah. on just <laughs> looking damn good yeah. um and then you know people people um well we find it attractive as well i suppose but um peacocks will find that attractive uh, and th and so the same way that music is like it's a way of effectively wasting energy um, it's it's ornamentation um and so yeah it's, so darwin was the first to, su to suggest and it and it's just um it's had quite a lot of uh rethought now and it's been um a lot of science has, has, has started to uh, take that view seriously again um but the and w one that sort of another idea that's uh, interested me was more of the group selection idea which is that if you go way way back um one of the main things that brought us together in in small tribes and uh you know very very small scale um human communities uh, would be social grooming um you know literal physically physically grooming uh, one another uh and as tribes got bigger and communities got bigger that's kind of impossible you can't go around and groom everyone every day and <laughs> keep that sort of sense of unity especially when language is incredibly primitive it's a, how do you sort of communi communicate how do you have that connection with someone um and so music is is kind of suggested uh to have been the thing that sort of replaced that on when when communities got bigger um and of and music when i say music in this sense i mean it to include dance as well as do lots of languages and especially primitive languages um or, or old uh, archaic languages um music and dance meant they, they had one word for both both of those things um and music was very communal um and that that's that really interests me because i think we sort of lost well maybe not lost lost our way is is to a divisive way of putting it but like when you get into sort of the 17th 18th 19th centuries and you see music come out of sort of uh you know perhaps people going to the the pub and get gathering around the piano and everyone having a dance you know that um it then became slightly less communal slightly less um just in, involving everyone and it, it went into uh halls and you'd be sitting down watching a performance of baroque or classical or whatever else um and when you advance a bit further than that where sort of i get interested again is where you have blues and skiffle and pop and rock and punk where it's still a performance 
but it, inc it involves audience participation. It involves people singing along, not just sitting there, you know, fanning themselves in a concert hall, going, oh, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> and, you know, there's there's space for that type of music, certainly. Um, that there's, um, I can argue for why that experience is important as well. Um, but then, yeah, when, muni when music becomes uh, a reason for us all to come together, all to sing along, to tie this, this whole prologue um, together, um, that's when oxytocin is, is central because as soon as you're singing with someone, you're releasing that chemical, which is dubbed the, the love hormone, the, the sort of bonding hormone. Um, it, it's, 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 a, it's something that feels good, basically. So a, a way of connecting, creating a, a very tangible um, sort of chemical connection with someone is just to sing in harmony with or in unison with someone. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful experience. It's a very sort of raw experience. And that's um, hopefully what music, um, which sort of, well, it sort of defines music as a unifying force because um, it, it defines it as worthwhile. Because if, if it releases this, this hormone, which is usually only released in orgasm um, or when you hug someone, a bit of it is, is released. Um, if, if you're singing with someone and that's released without any physical touch, you can tell that music is a, a powerful force. And what I like about it is it. You, there's also research to show that you don't have to be good at singing. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Which yeah. is good for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, that's the thing. A lot of people also think that they're, you know, they'll be quick to say, oh, I can't sing. I'm tone deaf and all this. And the amount of people that are actually tone deaf is is tiny, tiny percentage. So usually it's actually more of a, I don't know, you have a confidence thing yeah, definitely. or like something like that. So it's, yeah. Well, it's just on, a, on a personal note, for me, I think it comes back from when I first started secondary school, it was compulsory to try out for the choir and you had to go in a room one at a time and the head of music was there on the piano and I oh think my God. he would play, um, I think he played God Save the Queen and you would have to la to it. And I went in there thinking, I'm not going to be able to do this. And as I went in there, I thought last minute and I'm going to give it a go. And then it got to the point where he was like, could you just play that note again? And I was la la, and it was like, not not doing it. And he just kept, and you know, and then I didn't get in. And so funnily enough, I didn't want to be in the choir anyway, but I was kind of gutted. Yeah. And then I think it was a combination of things as well of um, when it was choosing our GCSEs, which again, for the global audiences, uh, the exams you choose um, at like 15, 16, uh, before you then do A-levels, which you then use to get into university or um, uh, other, other educational courses. Um, at parents evening the teacher told my parents that to summarise it Miles has a lot of passion for music he just doesn't have what it takes and kind of that fruit yeah, oh yeah yeah exactly um, and I went in to do drumming because for me it was more about feeling and didn't have to read music uh, and it's not to say that it's not a musical instrument of course it is but that was just my approach to it mm. as opposed to playing guitar where it's about notes and stuff and the idea of notes has always um not scared me but like i think um that confidence issue stays with you mm. and um actually two eps ago um at the end of one of our tracks um the producer said you should sing these three notes with the main vocalist because i, I for those of you that don't know, I, I scream in the band. Uh, we have someone who does the angelic vocals. <laughs> and uh, he says, um, can you do these three notes? And I think it took me 20 minutes to do it. And the moment it happened, I literally burst into tears because to feel that, like the vibrations and to know you could do it oh, uh, was like amazing. And I hear a lot of people, and there was a time where I did start getting vocal training. Um, and they told me that the amount of people that when you first learn to sing, especially if it's in later life, because yeah. a lot of people, if you if you sing as a kid and you don't have that confidence obstacle because you just do it, yeah. it's very easy to go into it. But if you're getting into your 20s and 30s and you've never really felt, I guess, like a lot of skills, if you're finally able to do it, it's a, and I think because the voice is such a, it's your, it's your instrument, it's your thing. And um, uh, it was just crazy. And like, I didn't, I didn't even, you know, take it up. I should have like, I should still, you know, follow it up and try and sing better. But there was something really powerful about learning to sing. And I think that um, uh, it must have something to do with, um, it, you know, the biology mm. and sort of the, the connection between it as an instrument and the fact that it is a part of you as who you are. 
Yeah, yeah, it's just the whole sort of finding your voice, like the cliche. Yeah, yeah, no, it has immense emotional. And when value. did you find your voice, or was it? Is it just uh, again one of those things that you just always? When did you first start singing? Because I can remember when I first started screaming, and I used to put on metal CDs and just my parents screaming hated on. it. Like, <laughs> what is he doing? Because it's not like you can really practice subtly. Yeah, unless you're yeah. gonna rent a <laughs> rental room. I used to do it into the pillow. <laughs> in my room and just like oh, just yeah. trying out different sort of ways of using the diaphragm and, the and everyone else is like, so what's what, going on? What are you <laughs> doing? You nutter, yeah. Um, I don't. I can remember. I have a distinct memory of um, being about nine, eight or nine, and uh, Chris, our bassist, uh, went to the same primary school, and me and him used to be sort of. I think we we said we were in a band, and we were like eight or nine, and uh, we used to just like. I can remember being on a school trip and just like standing at the back of, of the coach just on the seats and we were singing. I think we were singing like Beatles or something and we just learnt like what harmonising was and we were, we were probably horrendous at it. That's but... amazing because most of the time when it's singing on a bus it's ridiculous like laddish songs yeah, you know yeah, yeah. as a kid where it was so just like football songs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's nice. Beatles. <laughs> yeah, so sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that I think that's when I, f I first remember singing. Um, I don't think I was ever in any in any choirs or in, I mean there was a school choir, um, and you know you'd, you'd sing in assemblies and stuff. I went to like a C of E school. So, yeah, go tell it to the mountain. All them, all them <laughs> classics. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think I think that was when I properly like when me and Chris started just singing. Uh, I think we just thought, oh, this is back to, to Darwin's idea. Oh, this is a way to get attention. This right. is interesting. Oh, we've got attention from the females. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, but at nine, we probably also hated that. Like, Ooh, girls, you know. But um, yeah, but I think that was that was probably when I first started singing. And so fundamentally, what is the power of music? Like, because when we talk about it, like, biologically and psychologically there is an initial power in terms of community mm. but it's there's a difference between sort of community and wider society and you must have seen that transition over the years as again you've grown as a band to see the impact that music has and i know you've spoken in the past about the responsibility that should come with artists of you know when you build audiences you do have a, a responsibility to well some might argue to promote unity as yeah. opposed to division um, yeah well, you, you, I think you have as soon as you get uh, uh, any size of following you have to start thinking okay what am I putting out into the world because especially with, for, for big big bands like it's it's similar it's comparable to like religions of, of you know of old really you're, you're you have a following mm -hmm. people like are so emotionally invested in you and in your art um yeah there's a subliminal it, aspect to it as well isn't there yeah because yeah, although absolutely. you have strong messages in your music the forefront of it is actually just making music that people enjoy and then people yeah. that look further and there could be people that sing along to your songs not really thinking about it and then next minute they're like oh i was just singing about i don't know <laughs> the responsibility to our world and, yeah you know, yeah <laughs> yeah maybe something would have seeped in yeah 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 the, they're sort of through the back door but <laughs> yeah i i don't know it's um it's an interesting one. It's, I think it's something that we thought about quite early on, but we were, as you know, as I say, we were lucky enough to have like bands that were, the, you know, hardcore bands, punk bands that were already singing, effectively giving social commentary. So for, for me, it, it was like, well, that's normal. That's what music and social commentary is, is one thing. Mm. Um, but no, there's certainly, you know, lots of bands, you know, far, far bigger than us that obviously have have given this no thought or, or little thought and that's a it's a political decision as well you like you know the, the the classic statement that all music is political it's what you're putting out into the world whether you've thought about it or not is being received by people it's being thought about by people um so if you're not giving it much thought um that's a sort of abdication of your own moral duty <laughs> yeah. I think. and I, th I think the word political is always an interesting one because even when you talk about politics and you go to I'm just going to say the average person if you just go to anyone and go 
do you have an interest in politics? A lot of people are going to go no. But then if you say, do you have an the interest? The word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you have an interest in, I don't know, um, the cost of housing or education or safety on the streets and any issue? And they'll have an interest. And I think it's because we have so... We've become so embedded with this idea of associating the word political or politics with the political system, the way it currently runs, as in government, uh, as opposed to just society and the running of it. And I think that's the same with music, to your point that all music is political, but people would go, but not every band is talking about a key message. But no, everyone is coming to it with an interpretation of their world and a message. Yeah. And that has political consequences. And I think that as we're seeing the polarization in society in many ways, um, which I think is more down to perception than what is actually happening. And, and actually for me, and I think we'll come back to this issue a bit later, I think the interesting dichotomy with unity is as the world has become more unified in particular groups, the line that separates these groups of unity is becoming larger. Yeah. Um, so it's actually a, an interesting contradiction of when people say we're more divided than ever, I actually think we're more unified than ever, but in our different groups. Um, yeah. And, yeah. I, and I think that the challenge of our generation, and it definitely runs in a lot of the stuff I do in my videos, is focusing on how do you get these different groups of unity to talk with each other and not get so defensive. Yeah, that, that's that's the heart of the problem. Like everyone's so emotionally invested in their, their, their in-group, effectively, yeah. um, their ideology. Um, I think pe people confuse ideology for for self. They sort of they're, they're so invested in something, and 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 this is obviously where um, echo chambers accentuate this. You, if if you're hearing one point of view the whole time, and all your friends and everyone around you has that same point of view, yeah, that becomes part of your character. That's part of your very being. So when someone, even just a small criticism about your view, that's someone chipping away at you um so people are immediately are just so defensive um which yeah as you say i don't, it's I, i'm not sure if at the heart of it people are actually divided it's more that just conversation has broke down conversation is now it's all debate and usually heated debate which i i mean i i'm not very good at debate because i'm sort of quite introverted i avoid conflict <laughs> i'm like so i'm 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 not very good at it personally, but I don't think it's a very logical way to speak about ideas anyway. Like, I think conversation and looking at data and being quite anal about things is like really important, but that's not, it's all about winning the debate. Um, and that relies on rhetoric, which is a, a slimy, you know, writhing snake that anyone can use to, to put forth any view. Yeah, and it's it's all about the perception. And, and you're right about people that become defensive. And, and you talk about avoiding conflict. But we live in a world now where you're exposed to every issue that exists on this planet, not just in your local community, but around the world, whether it's wars in other countries and humanitarian disasters. And the point at which it becomes hurtful, and there have been times, I'm sure you relate, and I've definitely gone through this, where um, I've had moments of pure anxiety and despair learning about certain news because to be faced with a problem is to be faced with the question of what can I do and if you can't come up with a solution of what you can do directly then it just makes you depressed yeah and I think actually that comes to the heart of people that are unified in their groups when they get criticized um if you're criticized in a way that is not constructive and doesn't if if you discover something that you've thought about isn't actually the case but there's no stepping stone to where the right place to be is mm -hmm you're gonna feel that despair, you're gonna feel that frustration. And for me, the biggest misconception with finding common ground, um, a common platitude, which I, I believe is something that should be um, uh, always strived for, is people think that common ground is about meeting halfway, which I don't think it is. So as an example, and I'll declare myself as the racist for the example here, just so you, <laughs> you don't, be, let's say I was racist about a particular group of people and you weren't, and we were having a discussion and about our ideas and our perceptions. I think a lot of people think common ground would be, let's meet halfway, mm. I'll be half racist and you be half <laughs> racist as well. Yeah. When actually common ground is you saying, this is where I am and this is how I got here. And as you start laying out, let's think of it as like pebbles in, in the water to where you are, or to me, and then I do the same to you. 
it doesn't mean at the end of the conversation we have to have changed our minds. It just means that when we go away from the conversation, there is actually a pathway, an offshoot to think differently. Mm. And I think that's where you create the chance. Whereas when I think you speak to people who think very differently and you attack their ideas, this is a really, um, I've, I've used this metaphor before and I, it, it seems to work for me, so that's why I'm gonna use it. I saw this um, tech video many years ago about uh, a new stab proof vest that was made for the military. And the way it works is that if a knife is put into this vest, the molecules um, seize up to stop the knife going any further because the speed of it makes it react. But if it goes in slowly, it then can go in and oh, for God. me that's how i perceive ideas if you attack someone quickly they freeze up that's a brilliant and yeah, yeah. and and it just rejects it even yeah. if it was right now now obviously i'm not saying that good ideas <laughs> are knives but that's how it's perceived yeah um, so always go for the yeah, slow yeah. stab <laughs> and twist that, if you will and, and that <laughs> is the, and that is the part of the metaphor i'm not sure about <laughs> but i know that half of that works so um yeah but it, but when i saw that tech video i was like that's kind of like how people react with ideas is if you go in quickly yeah. especially with labels and that it's like end of conversation because you've already defined me and and that's the other thing is we are defined by our ideas and our beliefs which can change at any moment in time due to any experience mm. and on the one hand, as you say, it's about winning the argument, but it's also about being wrong is a sign of weakness. And I think that comes to the heart of the sort of system that we live in, because being wrong is is a form of enlightenment because it means you can improve, but it is yeah. also a knock on your status in a society where status is needed to make a living. Uh, and so that's why a lot of politicians will never admit they're wrong because that could lose them the job. Yeah, And so, it's not because they're bad people. It's no, I, I'm, I'm in this job because I think I can make a difference. And if the long term strategy is, it means not admitting I'm wrong, so I can stay in this job longer to do good for the world. It's a really messed up that yeah, the whole sort of psychological underpinning of, of the way we interact with each other and interact yeah on a large scale with with masses of people is like, is is set up wrong, isn't it really? Like, I, I think it, it conversations like these always usually hark back to like the damage that believing in free will has done i think like because if people understood that you, like you were saying like laying out your pebbles this is how i got here and you can you can work out all the experiences um you know throw in your genes as well that made you believe these things um people rarely look back and and analyze okay should I be believing that? I know that this made me believe that and, you know, cause and effect, cause and yeah. effect, cause, and that's how I got here today. Um, but yeah, but people are so invested in their own uh, sort of position and and so we're not given the, the skills and the tools, you know, in, in, in school sort of critical thinking and uh, emotional management, um, working out how to deal with anger, you know, all these things aren't, taught they're like they're, they're thought of as very specialist subjects that um instead of being taught them when you're young so you can avoid bad situations people wait till the bad situation comes and oh he needs therapy or, or whatever um so it's the whole thing's sort of set up quite backward isn't it it's just yeah instead of uh instead of uh preventative you know of avoiding bad situations it's all about um only dealing with it when things become drastically bad yeah and i think it's also because going back to the thing about you're exposed to so many issues around the world that you can't possibly deal with them mm. the average person just wants a comfortable life yeah, yeah, uh, yeah and so the easiest thing to do is to have your identity and stick with it because humans don't like change you want security and consistency and that also means in your own identity but unfortunately that's not how humans are and although it's nice to live a comforting life throughout history humans have had to fight for survival on a daily basis and the fact that we live in this comfort i mean people talk about things like you know we are a generation that's never experienced a world war has that meant that we're now numb to the possibility and mm. therefore complacent and i think that also comes into the fact of our role as citizens of you know some people think that you grow up you go to school you get a job you have a good time you retire and that's the cycle of life yeah yeah um, whereas actually you have a responsibility on this planet, but is it our right to tell someone else that is your responsibility? Or is it just this form of consciousness that we can 
create to make people realize that through unity through empathy that because of our connections um you don't feel forced you just feel responsible and that you want to do something and um for me it's the outside out of my mentality i've always described that once you become conscious of an issue you can't the genie's out the bottle you can't look at an injustice i mean some people can look at injustice and turn away because it's too much but what i mean is that once you learn in quite quite a lot of detail about an issue you can't unlearn that you can get a different perspective on it but then you can't unlearn it and so i think that as we become more globally conscious about how we are all connected um and that how you know we're all products of circumstance depending on where you're born in the world and what your background is not just in terms of people who are victims of humanitarian crises and things like that but people that are also victim of coming up um, and I use that for victim is just because I know there'll be some people going oh people aren't really victims but I'm just going to use victims like <laughs> that um, there are people that are victims that they're brought up in um, conditions that cause them to do bad things um, I see them as victims as well like we are all victims of, of circumstance and and so I think by going for unity and empathy it at least gives people the chance and that sort of that the, the pebble path to then actually change um, yeah because if people feel they don't have an opportunity to change and you can go into like social media shaming and stuff like that and you define people for one mistake for the rest of their lives then why would people want to change at all because they're mm. thinking fine if that's how you're going to define me then there's no point in changing um and that gets to the heart of all other issues like rehabilitation <laughs> and, and things like that yeah I, I i feel like that the maturity is like when you start you don't just dive in straight away you go okay someone has done something bad why have they done that thing that's bad instead of just going oh you're a this and yeah, name yeah. calling effectively um i think and, and i think a lot of people never mature in that respect it's just they're just uh they find the the act um you know just horrible and then they just the only way to react to that is just by uh distancing you know the us versus them and uh which which comes into play from morality if you have a moral compass and you see someone who's done something bad i don't want to be associated with them and it's yeah the, and it the us and them happens in that way instead of like we could probably have a conversation educate them and stuff and also everyone makes mistakes everyone is ignorant on certain issues you know we have some people that fight for some causes and not others it doesn't make one person good and the other person bad. Mm. It means someone's gone so far along a certain journey uh, down one path and the other person's gone down another path. And actually, if they talk to each other, they would learn from the other paths that are taken. And that comes to the heart of what empathy is about. Empathy is about the fact that you can't live every possible life in one lifetime. Um, People that have died because of certain mistakes you know whether it's health and safety or you know throughout history of, of certain illnesses you don't have to experience it or if you look at telling a kid don't touch the pan because it's hot every kid hasn't had to touch the pan to know that mm-hmm. um if you see someone do it ah, that empathy means now i don't have to do it and so i feel that that is why communication and unity is so important because by having those conversations you learn from other people's mistakes yeah um absolutely and, and one of my favorite lines that you've ever done in Enet Shikari is unity's intrinsic, the only cause, cause worth fighting for. Yeah, yeah. Is it the only cause worth fighting for? <laughs> Love. Love, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but go into sort of unity and how it is intrinsic. and Because, uh, I mean, I think we've sort of answered this already in our discussion so far. But, like, even when you were writing, <coughs> writing that, and um, I can't remember the song off the top of my head um, that was from. Um, but... Um, was it from uh, Step Up? No, it wasn't. I'm going to mess up. <laughs> Mate, I'm useless yeah, yeah. at this. You've done like, enough songs. Yeah, own, I have to go from the beginning of the song, get to the lyric. Um, is it Constellations? Might be Constellations. Oh, I don't know. Um, but I, I think it's it's a it's a deduction of like from big history, really. Like the what are the facts? The facts are we are one species on one planet. We have one chance at this if we want to, you know, go forth and populate our galaxy. And uh, if if that's your version of, of success as for a species. Um, and 
so it, we are not going to achieve much uh, outside of what we already have if if we don't put unity at the forefront of of everything we're doing like it, it, if you think of like conflict where we're at now um with you know everyone's talking about the the possible tensions between Russia, America, China, all the big sort of superpowers and then you know everything that go, goes on in North Korea or with Israel and Palestine um all those things they have like the the prospect of war or further conflict between those countries now with the technologies that we have and with oncoming AI which is terrifying and obviously the nuclear possibilities the conflict and and possible war between those countries has to become like as utterly ridiculous as the thought of like war between Wales and England like you know if you th think of think if we woke up tomorrow and the headline was Wales and England at war you'd be just like wait what yeah like, what's there to fight about we're like the same aren't we and then you start thinking well what's there to fight about with you know Russia and, and whoever else and whatever country you know right on the dotted line yeah we're all the same aren't we like effectively like, um so yeah we, we have to get to that situation that's the only not just sane um outlook but the only logical out outlook if we want to survive because our our technology i think it was einstein who first talked about this how our technology is advancing far far quicker than our humanity our, our ability to perceive the other as us um and i think uh, you know i don't know whether einstein would have predicted how we're, how we're at now but like you know it's the flick of a button and that's that's the species you know pretty much extinct um so it's a it's a we're right on that cliff edge now so our humanity our our logic our rationality our empathy has to catch up like, yes quick sharp <laughs> or, or we're fucked yeah that really is it <laughs> yeah that i mean that goes to the heart of um and really well put of, of i feel where my activism is based which is there is this sort of race to the finish line between um global consciousness and maturity and technological advancements mm. because if we don't evolve our value systems the technology will be used to perpetuate old ones which is the us and them and yeah. will eventually destroy ourselves and um jerry rifkin in his book which i've got here the empathic civilization he goes through history and he says talks about how empathy is able to uh be felt as far as you are able to communicate so he talks about tribes uh, used to see another tribe over the mountain and because they didn't communicate with them they were the other and they wouldn't empathize and so it was all about empathy was about blood ties and then um when you had um scripture you had religions form and then empathy extended as far as religious ties you know the muslim muslims christians jews hindus you name it and then you had nation states and even i didn't really appreciate um a lot of nations they weren't they're pretty recent in human history yeah, like yeah. I, the, the, the thing i always like to tell my american friends is london has a toy store that is older than the united states of america <laughs> which is is it hamley's i think yeah hamley's <laughs> toy store um <laughs> which because i think america's what, about 200 years old um about um and but that is how we empathize it's all about national pride mm. and so what jeremy rifkin talks about in his book is if we've come this far as you say the only next step is global empathy but yeah. it's can we get there in time before we rip each other apart <laughs> does, does he say anything about how it's is it almost like an inbuilt bug in our system that we can only empathize with like neatly you know organized compartmentalized groups and like global empathy whoa that's just that's there's too many people because there's a lot of like studies that are done into if you show you know the you know that classic picture from a few years ago of the the dead uh child the immigrant on the beach where was it in italy or something uh, alan cuddy i think his name was yeah. yeah yeah and um people immediately like you know fucking hell that's awful you're hit there's an emotional response there whereas as soon as you uh, show them 10 people our response goes down yes which is just like what surely the 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 more suffering the more we should suffer in response but we don't it's yes. almost like a defense mechanism i can't 
uh, empathize with that amount of suffering. So I'm just not my my empathy is going to go down as someone else's or right. a group of other people's suffering goes up. Um, does does he? Well, talk he, about anything he, like he, that? he does go into the sort of the the, the 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 neurology of the fact that you know empathy comes from mirror neurons, which is that um, it was an experiment where I think there was a monkey. Uh, that was trying to get into a nut, into a shell, and couldn't do it. And I think in this strange moment, a scient- they, they sort of went away and a, a scientist came in and just took a nut and opened it. And then the monkey then did it. And they actually found that when they repeated that experiment, the mirror neurons were firing up. Uh... And it's the fact that when you see someone <clears throat> smile and you smile, it's because when your mirror neurons fire, you're actually experiencing what they do. Yeah. And so I think that on a one-to-one basis, that is, you can relate to one experience, but then if you have 10 people, then it's it's saturated, it's like spread out, and mm. it, 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 you're only one person, so the best, uh, the, more, the, the most reflective way of that experience is one person, if you get what I mean. So I think that by having it spread out, that makes it more difficult. But I think... Um, there are things that are shaping it in a positive way. Like when we go to war with another country now, it's not just strangers from afar. They're people you might know online. I think yeah. the fact that yeah, we're yeah, yeah. having these friendships and... Um, Which is a benefit of technology, the advancement yes. of technology as well, isn't it? The world's got so much smaller. And that's obviously the, again, the sort of, not just the way it's going, but the logical way it's getting, you know, cut to however many years in the future where we all basically look the same because all the yes the the races have, have you know convened yes um and I, the, I and i think the people that worry about globalization i think there are concerns about globalization is because the negatives come from the fact that we have outdated systems that are running the show effectively that haven't updated with technology you know we talk about you know mental health which we actually we'll get to a bit in a, in a bit but also um you know critical thinking um critical thinking has just come out of nowhere because you know social media has only been sort of prevalent for about 10 15 years um and um a lot of the work i've been doing with the be internet citizens um initiative that google are doing with a with the institute of strategic dialogue i'm going to be interviewing a few of the facilitators on a future podcast we've been going into schools and talking about critical thinking and the us first them and it's been amazing to see these young people learn it and sort of come up with it but um you know it, it was because traditionally education was about we have a curriculum we have a finite amount of information our job is to now teach these kids and pass the information on but now when kids go home it's not that they don't just go on their bikes in fields like I used to do as a kid. <laughs> it's now you're bombarded by information on social media and the news. Um, as a quick sidestep, I'll never forget that when I was in my second year of um, pr- elementary school, uh, my parents were called in by my teacher because I was voicing concern in class about a British hostage that was on the news in some country. And they were like, I don't think should be watching the news because he's worrying quite a lot about it it's like the six o'clock news but that was a really interesting thing there mm. about like that was when you know you only really had the six o'clock news whereas now you just are bombarded with news constantly so yeah, there'd be, be no escaping yeah exactly and because there's this bombardment of information and it's crazy seeing all these kids with their smartphones i was saying to them when i was in school i had a nokia phone that could either text or play snake and they say what snake and i was like oh no i'm so <laughs> old but you know they have social media which is like an extension of like um power dynamics and social circles and bullying you know now that, that stays with you once you leave school because it's there on your feeds and things like that so the challenge for teaching now is yes that it is about passing on knowledge of specific subjects but it's also teaching young people how to become journalists themselves and how to navigate through mass information oh yeah and the fact that it hasn't been done before because we haven't needed to and now we have mass information it's why you're seeing people um and i'm not going to talk about any particular group because i think it happens on all groups of all arguments which is people making ill-informed decisions because there are people in older age people in my in their 30s who weren't taught these skills and now they're bombarded with all this information and you don't know what is fake news and and what is real and i think that's the real challenge of our time um because the information is only going to become more abundant of varying qualities but then then i find on the flip side it's interesting like i remember years ago 
if you ever mentioned looking something up on Wikipedia, people would laugh and like journalists yeah. would always go, what? But now I hear him on the radio saying, well, actually, Wikipedia is a really good resource. It, it and managed to, yeah, get get rid of that sort of yeah. negative thoughts that everyone had about it. Yeah. Um, and so I just think that um, that is the, the, the thing we have to really fight through is is teaching young people. And actually, one of the people from the Institute of uh, Strategic Dialogue said something really interesting and when I told him, he was like, I'll make sure I use that line again. He basically said, when it comes to young people online, and you know, there are dangerous people out there, there's a lot of um, case studies where um, a young kid makes 60 friends who gets them making videos for extremist content, and it turns out those 60 friends were one person. And so they'd been groomed. They thought they had this social grouping online, right. and it was just one person that was mm. old and just trying to get them to have a certain ideology and they got them making youtube videos on certain topics and stuff which oh, is wow. um, and but what he said was when it comes to dealing with the dangers of you know extremism online and um, you know mass information and fake news and that the first line of defense is the child themselves which i thought was a really good point because so often you think about we've got to protect young people but it's like but at the end of the day whenever you talk about people that are going out there the first line of defense is is the victim of whatever we're talking about and so it's how do we best equip people to deal with it mm. whilst also dealing with the root causes because otherwise we get into cases of people saying oh we're victim blaming now saying it's all about the victim should yeah, you know? yeah. and I, I think that's a really unhelpful um sort of binary discussion that gets done when you talk about coming up with solutions people go oh you can't come up with a solution that helps the victim because it shouldn't be happening at all and I'm always <laughs> like, well, yeah, like my car shouldn't be stolen, but I still have a lock on it. Um, yeah, it would be nice to live in a world where someone doesn't steal my car, but that doesn't mean you can't put precautions in there. Mm. And I think that also comes to the heart with these issues of dealing with mass information and and also teaching people about the power of unity and what it is to be emotionally manipulated and, yeah. and to be pitted against each other, which is the age-old trick of established order of trying to divide and conquer <laughs> yeah, yeah <so>. um <laughs> and do you, do you think we're um we're capable of like being taught the, the skills on a, on a on a wide scale of um you know being able to differentiate what's fake news what's spurious and false reporting or and what isn't because i i I feel like it, you know fake fake news isn't like a, a new thing you know no. it's, it's as old as news itself like people who have a political aim um are gonna put dodgy stuff out there if it's gonna yeah, benefit their cause but like now with the it's like there's the added uh financial uh like objective as as well um you know when everything that happened with facebook and that uh what was that little group it was in Mas macedonia or oh, something oh yeah that like uh, you know put all those uh, crazy articles out i think the, the massive one was that the, the pope endorsed trump um, in his presidential election campaign. and we use that in the school example actually oh, yeah, yeah 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 it's a really good one yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean it's meant to, but that but they made so much money just because th these uh, articles went viral so now that it's not just the political objective there's the it, it's it's financially you know a, a good thing um, and obviously there's facebook and all the the, the social media channels sure. can do their bit but like that's that's a lot of reason to put out false yeah you know news now and it's just, I'm not sure whether whether if there's some like I don't I don't think there can be a sort of governmental body that can come in and, and be like the like defining fact yeah. checking because yeah. then people are going to be like oh it's the government oh I can't trust them it's either. a centralised like, body oh my God. yeah yeah <laughs> no, I'm with you. I don't really know what the uh, the long term like solution is there it's so I, I was going to answer your question in one way and then when you got to the latter example i was then going to go the other way so the first bit in terms of should we be worried about how this is going about so i think yes because when we look at ai and you see all these uh, these um computer programs where you get a uh, like a president i don't know if you've seen it and then they map your face and as you start talking it makes yeah. it look like so not only can you replicate a voice uh, it's a an yeah. actual moving image it's right like, whoa when you compare it to like growing up all the ufo photos of just yeah. like really terrible like cut out the Loch Ness like, monster yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now, come on a long way but now it's going to become more difficult so i think yeah. in that way um i, I apparently I, you look at the eye, the eyes that's the giveaway and blinking especially right. 
but that's the only, the only but way. that will get fixed. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's yeah, yeah. what I mean. It's it's only a matter of time. But on the other side, when you talk about like the financial um, motivation for <laughs> posting articles that just get shared and clicked, uh, clicked on, I have hope with that. And for me, it's because it's how the the monetization of content is going to change because already we're seeing around the world now in online companies ad spend is going down and it's actually because of saturation there are so many articles these days that the amount of it's called inventory which are the slots in which an ad will sit so if you have a advert before your video on youtube the inventory slot is basically the slot in which it, oh i want to put my advert there mm. just to get all technical but um so that so so the the cost of adverts are going down, um, but it's also the fact that clickbait. Um, I think those days are numbered because when you look at like I think that one of the biggest websites in the world is the Daily Mail um, because they do so much clickbait. And actually, when you look at their articles and you scroll down, their articles are so long and they actually end up saying the same thing again and again because as you scroll down, you're seeing more and more adverts huh. and more and more impressions and that. But that, it's not exclusive to them. Every, everyone's doing yeah. it. But what's happening is because it's harder and harder to make money through ads now and because people are using stuff like ad blocker, which is a problem, but it's not the entire problem, um, people are now having to switch to subscription models. So um, The Guardian is... is is doing a membership membership that you can sign up for and um, i think every other article says hey now we've got your attention can you yeah, which yeah. i find really depressing because i'm like <laughs> it's it's just every other article um but then i think you know when we look at who we subscribe to and obviously this podcast has been done through grassroots subscriptions so please patreon.com forward slash miles dyer <laughs> help us out a uh, dollar a month would help um but people can only only have so much money and there's only so many services they can subscribe to so is it amazon prime or is it um spotify for music or is it netflix for video is it what well, amazon prime has music uh video and i think they have music now mm, as well yeah. so you've got to make all these choices and so when it comes down to who are you going to subscribe to it's going to be with brands you have an affinity with that you believe in and so the guardian people might subscribe because they believe that they do really great journalism I became a fan of them um, because of the Edward Snowden coverage they did about the NSA. There are things since then that I've not been a fan of, but that's the way it goes. Mm. You know, with um, you know, they're big organisations; they'll do different kinds of reporting. Um, when you look at um, a news organisation like the Daily Mail, which has been mainly funded via um, whether it's sponsorship or clickbait, all that traffic. If you then went to all those people that are driving that revenue and for all the clicks and that what percentage of them do you think have an affinity with the brand of the daily mail and if you went to and said do you want to subscribe for us on a monthly basis to support our paper i don't think and so i think that switch (coughs) is going to pull the rug under a lot of the clickbait because clickbait is no longer going to be something people actually value yeah um it's something they'll do on a lunch break or that that's really interesting Um, immediately i'm making the comparison between basic gig what i would call clickbait music so right. like very uh banal pop music basically bubblegum is the usual phrase people use which is i'm oh, sorry but what's bubblegum bubblegum music just you know just oh i said yeah just like just easy just, li- li- like yeah ear candy like, like just me- yeah very middle of the road like <laughs> tom york described it as fridge buzz just, just noise <laughs> just it, it, there's no dynamics to right. it it's just you know switch a mainstream radio channel on the middle of the day and that, yeah. that's that's what it is um but yeah that that stuff they don't have any support because there's there's no i, I don't want to use the word brand here obviously because it doesn't really fit in terms of art, artistry but it, it's similar in the fact that people aren't invested into these artists because the the, the people that listen to that type of pop music will just listen to that type of pop music and 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 all of the you know the the lifespan of a of a of someone in that realm of music is very short um because people are always looking for the next thing um whereas like say when you have the the guardian or whatever it is a, a brand that people sort of like believe in um which i would then make the comparison to artists who have grown up built a fan base um they built a community around their music yes. their, their music is uh, you know, people are emotionally invested in it, um, and usually rightfully so, and like uh, amazingly so. Um, 
but that yeah, this definitely feels like a a, meta, a meta, metaphor for for music in that respect as well. I, I can see things hopefully going going the same way. The clickbait music taking a, a bit of a hit as as yeah. people just um, prefer more trusted sources of information or or yeah. music. But, and I think it's also because when we were talking just before we started recording this podcast about the amount of movies and albums that come out and it's what do I need to listen and watch next and it's no longer kind of what we're talking about with education the abundance of information there is now an abundance of good content mm. um, it's not a question of like what is the good movie out this week it's like which good movie do I want to watch yeah. and so the it's no longer about well you just subscribe to the good band or you know promote the good band it's no you have to choose and so not to get too granular with the example but let's just say we had like a 10 really good bands that were all doing a a membership or a subscription model um you'd hope that it would work out that fat people that are fans of all 10 of the bands if it did split a tenth each way that it would still be enough to keep them all going and so the thing that you hope in society is that it doesn't become too centralized that out of those 10 bands, one of them's getting all the subscriptions right. and none of the others are. And yeah. that, can, that can force them out. And I think that is the problem that can come with it. So um, it's not to say that the subscription model is going to fix everything, but I think the, the clickbait aspect um, is going to struggle. But saying that as well, um, clickbait is still powerful mm. um, and it may disrupt some of the bigger organizations that have massive overhead costs to deal with. But it's not going to stop independent people. And, and another aspect to it all is big news organizations are now competing against people that are willing to do the same job for free. Because if you have someone who's on the street at a protest and they record on their phone something that sh they share and goes viral, um, they did that for free. They didn't get paid to do that. Um, now, let's say that you've got um, a different person doing that every day in the world. That means that big news organizations are now competing with effectively a free news organization yeah. but it's like that's the outer world and it's the same with music like you're going to compete against people that maybe do a free giveaway but if you've got a band doing a free giveaway every day of the year obviously it will be multiple bands doing it every day of the year mm. as that becomes more prevalent it means that we in all industries you're going to be competing against free and not just free but free and good quality yeah uh, and I think that, and this gets to a whole other discussion about how our economic system is going to be under strain. But I think that gets to the heart of some of the problems we're going to have because the cost, the cost of things, is going to keep going down. Um, yeah. And people are going to be spending less and less money, maybe more on subscription models. I, th I think also like the, the, like the again the sort of the clickbait clickbait thing might sort of dwindle a bit because. I, I found this you know usually you sort of think about things as like a it's almost like an addiction so you get you know information from a clickbait thing you get quick um it's like that little shot of dopamine and then you you want some more information more information so that's why twitter's so good because you can just scroll oh yeah more information yeah excellent move on to the next thing um and I find that's, that's why Twitter's so good <laughs> <laughs> wait good <laughs> I know what um, you mean though. yeah um but I think me I personally and I think people are having this the same sort of feeling that I don't really find that satisfying anymore like I've I've started like this year I've started trying to like properly read again like where you sit down and you're actually reading about a subject or or whether it's fiction or non-fiction for a decent amount of time instead of just going oh bit of that oh oh bit of that um and it it, it feels a lot more fulfilling um so I, I so yeah I'm not sure again how if if there'll be a life much of a, a longevity to to that style of reporting because i i just feel like i'm never really like learning anything or gaining anything it's just that quick sh sh that minute quick shot of you learn slogans me. and talking yeah, points yeah. even if it's not intentionally done as talking points yeah and that's what causes division because what you find is people read those talking points they say them with some kind of understanding backing it but yeah. they don't want to debate it because as soon as you debate it you realize there's not there's actually no a lot of substance standing. to yeah, it yeah, yeah. and this is why we need <laughs> experts in the world and people that have studied their entire lives particular topics yeah and realize it's okay that you don't know something about it and that but just don't don't be confident about it don't that's what i, I hate when people obviously have a 
a very surface level understanding of something possibly from reading just one article and they almost they devoured the headline and that's it um but then it like forms part of their view on something and it's like don't go in with an ego with like you know everyone likes to think that they're right and and uh, people like to come up and say look what i've learned which is cool yeah but but that has now actually come into mainstream discourse of like you know people think about being on the right side of history i mean we all do it i i, I like to think that in certain yeah. ways that i'm fighting the we all we're wanna, all smart we, we all want to <laughs> think that we're doing the right thing but the, yeah having that surface level understanding and it makes me think of um the late jacques fresco who um is the founder of the venus project as, as you know um he, he talked about he talked about this decades ago and i think it's never been more true he talks about when he talks about freedom of speech he says freedom of speech is really important um but everyone shouldn't have the right to their own opinion and he didn't mean that in a sort of authoritarian way of like everyone should be silenced but he says that we need to have respect for um expertise because he says like if he designed an aircraft that could fly without wings someone who was just the the average person on the street would go oh it doesn't have wings it won't fly whereas a scientist would say it doesn't have wings how would you propose it flies yeah there's yeah. the inquisitive aspect of it but it's just that 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 ability to say i think this but i'm not sure like it's very simple just say that don't you don't have to say nah surely not no nah, i don't believe you or whatever you know. but the problem with this and i think this is and <laughs> this is going to sound like potentially like i've got a chip on my shoulder i'm i'm it, this isn't the whole reason i think over the years of doing youtube there have been times where i've done videos which have done hundreds thousands millions of views and i know that if i kept doing it i could build a healthy audience but i haven't gone down that path because i try and care about nuance and like you know level understanding or or, or having a balanced understanding of things and Mm. not always being on the fence but not misrepresenting either side so when i did videos about brexit or trump um i had audiences that pr- praised the videos who were both um brexit supporters and remainers and trump supporters and hillary clinton supporters or third party bernie sanders supporters and the reason they respected my content was because um they thought i wasn't misrepresenting anyone right and i think that's really important because for me it's like if you really believe that you have an idea worth sharing just argue on the merits don't argue on the argument itself don't yeah, yeah, come yeah. out with slogans and stuff but the reason i bring it up is that the problem with it is um nuance isn't very sexy and <laughs> so if you do a video about an issue and go for example immigration is bad here are the re- 10 reasons why immigration is terrible it'll get loads of shared it'll get shared by all the people that agree with it and it also gets shared with the people who disagree with it and go can you believe this person saying it yeah. on the flip side here is a video 10 reasons why immigration is good all the people that agree go yeah see here are 10 reasons why it's good and uh the people going ah, oh, look at this person thinks immigration is all good and well this binary thing and they'll share it as well and i've been when i worked for news organizations i definitely was someone who was talking about um, when doing opinion pieces, it'd be good to get someone on two sides of the argument because then it will get shared in those communities. So I totally get systemically why it's appealing yeah. because it gets shared. But then if you did a video where going, here are 10 things about immigration. I don't even know, not even saying that, just 10 going discussion points about something. the immigration. It yeah. won't get shared because it, it will get shared, but not as much. And so mm. that's why the temptation there. And, and, and that is- I think a- people also like, the fact that you're telling them what to believe here here is what you should believe it is easily laid out 10 reasons why immigration is good or yes. bad whereas 10 here's 10 points for you to think about yes it's like, oh, oh that's a bit of effort isn't it yeah <laughs> like, i don't have time for that i don't have time for sure. that you know i'm not i'm Cause, not like cause, finger pointing right because <laughs> when it comes to issues like immigration i have quite a, 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 a mixed opinion on it and it's not in the sense of i'm against immigration i'm for it i'm also someone who believes one people one world borders as you say just are just lines in the sand yeah yeah um but but also you have to look things logistically and so when you see m- mass movements of people like millions moving because of wars and climate disaster it's we have to deal with the immigration crisis and we have to help people as much as we can yeah but it's not sustainable 
if we don't deal with the root causes of you know not taking resources from countries and depleting their resources and yeah. destabilizing governments and you know we've got the resources now we'll just deal with the problem later down the line we should be trying to improve the world as a whole because otherwise and i think this gets to the heart of a lot of issues we're going to see in our lifetime which is if you have centralized power whether it's in terms of wealth or resources or um, information um, energy systems people move to it that's it because people move to better their lives mm. and so and and so i've gone through a very quick overview of sort of my views on immigration which is i think we should be helping people but i also think that we need to look at long-term sustainability and we can't afford for areas of the world to become depleted and i think i learned a year or two ago that um i think it was in pakistan um they had one day which was 50 degrees centigrade which is unbelievable and so like when you look at issues like climate change and people go yeah it's a bit hotter but i can deal with it yeah here yeah. you can but you have no understanding of people where their industries are farming and it's not farming so they can sell it to other countries so, so obviously a lot are it's also so their family can survive yeah and so this has a whole impact and so just even having that discussion right now there will be people listening to this who are on one side or the other going oh so he's for immigration this is bad for this and there are people that are for immigration going oh he's given some criticism so he's a xenophobe and you know yeah. for example <laughs> and but that that gets to the heart of it of the binary that is so tempting online yeah because <clears throat> you want to feel that you belong to a group which comes back to unity but by that very nature can the world become unified through nuance and and that's i think that's the question but then i also think um if th we do become one people one world and there is global empathy that is an understanding that we are all different like it happens in all mm. you know not everyone who's a christian acts and thinks you know um people uh, black people in america aren't a monolith uh, which they, they definitely in the 2016 elections got absolutely annoyed with when the news is talking about well black people normally vote democrat and they're like I'm not defined by the colour of my skin. Yeah. Different black people vote in different ways. Like, it shouldn't even have to Is be it... said. But, like, you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. within... And, and actually, I had written here another one of your lyrics. And, by the way, I looked up that other song. It was Fanfare for the Conscious Man. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's got a little pop quiz here. <laughs> um, or woke pop quiz. Um, <laughs> but you, um, in, in Torn Apart, you, you said, um, you see there's more variation, more within populations than between populations. Yeah. What, what was at the heart of, of that? Because I can't remember off the top of my head in terms of the research, but it's... Yeah, well, it, it's, it's interesting because in, individualism is one of sort of the pillars of capitalism, really, but it's kind of nitpicked. It's like individualism when it suits capitalism and when it doesn't. Um, and so what, what I'm saying there is uh, kind of influenced by the way that medicine is uh, advancing and how in the future medicine will be completely personalized completely customized towards you yep. towards your genes you know we're all susceptible to different things be it physical or mental health um and the the logical way that the medicine industry has the health industry has worked out is that each person has to be treated like a an individual um and I, and so that i think that has repercussions to how we've thought about race and race you know possibly just being a, a social construct really um and that that's almost a direct quote in in the lyrics there from a a study i'm not gonna be able to remember any of the details Sorry. of it now it's in my book dear future historians there we go. The, the essays about about the track and we can put it in the video description cool. anyway if anyone wants to look into it yeah, yeah. i mean and, and there's a lot of arguments still over over kind of race and um how much of it is you know the, the genetics behind it and um but it appears to be that the the kind of general consensus is over anything else we're individuals you can't tell much apart from from the physical aspect the visual aspect of a different person um you you can't differentiate them from other people based on race really for any other uh meaningful uh, reason this is what fascinates me about science is a lot of the social the social evolution of the human species comes out of learning about sort of the crux of our biology 
Mm. Like it's the fact, and again, I can't even remember the specific research, but it was um, they found in a cell. I think it was it was like a wheel, like in the human body, there is a wheel that operates and you know what? rotates. And so when we think about the greatest invention, <laughs> is um the human either the human just created the wheel it's the fact no it's already oh my god when, yeah. you, when you think about biomimicry yeah 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 you could have invented the wheel well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but when you think about like roads you have motorways and then they go into a roads in the uk and then you have um little cul-de-sacs and like small roads same with your vein uh, your arteries right. and then your yeah, capillaries yeah. and stuff and nature's thought of it yeah, thought of it before. yeah 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 and yeah. it's kind of like as we're learning about mirror neurons and like empathy and we discover more about how we work it, it's kind of like we can learn so much about ourselves of how I just find the evolutionary aspect so fascinating mm. and like you know Carl Sagan often talked about how that we are the universe's way of feeling itself or you know becoming conscious about itself and yeah. it's kind of like by us looking at who we are as human beings we're actually learning a lot about what the solutions are but then there are obviously negative sides like you know we i know when richard dawkins is talking about darwinism and people go oh so you think we should all be fighting against each other survival of the fittest oh, he's like social Darwinism. yeah 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 oh. and he's like no 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 by learning about it we can also learn how we can the negatives as well as yeah yeah and so <laughs> so it's not to say yeah we should just do everything that's uh naturally come about it's like yeah, no we yeah. can we can evolve from it but i think there's a, a lot of lessons there um we we talked briefly earlier about um sort of um oh, we definitely talked with regarding social media and twitter and things like that but um when it comes to biology and i think it's this new wave coming over of mental health and well-being and i know that you talk a lot about it um and, and i do too um what has your sort of journey been with mental health and well-being and has it really shaped in the last 10 years because of social media do, do you feel that that's really n not in terms of just making people more aware of it but it's kind of really brought out uh, it's emphasized the issues that we have when it comes to social anxiety and things like that yeah i think well what it, what social media does is let you know that you're not alone um because sometimes it's a kind of a millennial thing to put a certain experience out there online something that you perhaps wouldn't actually say to someone face to face even yeah. to a friend or a family member but like in the moment when you you just like it's almost out of uh you know just a drastic like oh i'm just gonna put that out there um you know and there's negative and positive reasons to do that but i think that that's there's there's a lot of history to that like i've, I've been reading a lot of um montaigne a french essayist or philosopher really but um and he talked about how uh in his books he, he was a very transparent very open just frank without everything about his life and but he'd put it in into his books into his essays but he wouldn't necessarily say anything to to his you know friends or family members because it's like a like writing like being an author and being a reader is quite an introverted thing but then when when you're writing something that's so personal about yourself or something it actually becomes quite an extroverted thing because you're giving away a big part of yourself and you're putting it out there in a library to be read um and i think effectively that's what social media is nowadays it, it's the ability to you have a lot of control over it you can present yourself however you want to which has, has a lot of negative effects when people hide bad aspects about their lives and everyone scrolls through seeing what an amazing life everyone has and then yeah. we see depression and anxiety go up so there's some negatives there um but it's also yeah a, a amazing because it, it brings us closer together it makes us realize that when people are uh communicating their negative uh experiences be it mental health or otherwise we can we can empathize with it we can go we can you can speak to a stranger and say oh i had an experience that was similar to that this is what happened to me um and and that's exactly what happened to me i, I think for many years i had absolutely no realization of my mental health i, I wasn't very like i was very self analytical almost in a um subconscious way you know in the typical way that anxiety does i was constantly ruminating about my behavior oh i shouldn't have said that you know i'd feel shame for for some totally insignificant thing or i'd be anxious about something that was about to happen and the, the classic um definition of anxiety experiencing failure in advance you know I, i'd 
be constantly thinking, oh, this is going to go wrong and that's going to go wrong. And I'd always have anxiety after events. Um, but I had no idea what that was. I just thought that was me and I, I had to deal with that. And that was just a some idiosyncrasy that, yeah, I was, I was faced with. Um, and it wasn't until things got so bad, which is so often the way that when, when you, you have to sort of hit, hit, hit rock bottom to like effectively do anything about it. Um, and yeah, for, for me, that was in, in 2015 where I just like that, I guess, just complete exhaustion and I had a horrific panic attack, was hospitalized for a bit. And then after that, I had like three, four months of insomnia. And of course, with sleep deprivation, anxiety goes through the roof. Yeah. It's more thinking was, time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, had depression for a while and some OCD, you know, a nice cocktail of, of mental health things to, to deal with. Um, and it wasn't. It, it was the, all of that experience that made me basically get a grip and start uh, looking inward a lot more and realizing what I had and uh, sometimes just putting a name to a, an experience that you have a lot can go, oh, okay, so there's, what this has been studied? This is a thing? I, I can learn about this and I can possibly therefore get better? Um, but it's a huge relief, really. Um, and I'm quite, I'm quite frustrated at myself for, for never sort of um delving into you know learning about about these the experiences that i was having before then but i think that's actually a reflection of how bad education system is or at least when i i was at school a long time ago <laughs> when i was at school patchwork um, it's <laughs> like yeah you learn about it once you need it and yeah. it's like yeah. it's, it's like well-being as a whole it's like eating well mm-hmm. um they say that I, I learn a lot like i try and go to the gym and i you, for me, well-being, it's just juggling all these things. It's like mindfulness, it's eating well, exercise. But they say like, it's you can do exercise all you want, but if you're not eating well to begin with, you're not going to feel the benefits. Mm. And so it's like having a whole perspective of like the whole journey of well-being. And these are, these are I, I wish I'd learned cooking in school. Like <laughs> my, my parents talked about learning it. Um, I can't remember what it was called. Um, it's like domestic. Did you not have home, home ed? Oh, that was what, it, yeah, no. I, I, I remember making... Uh, yeah. What was it like? Fish and chips. All right, Mister Master Chef. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, I mean, not not the most yeah well being meal, is it? The most healthy so, meal. So was it every week? No, it was. You know how you do like woodwork for a month, home right. ed for a month, and the electronics from you know in primary school. No, 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 no secondary second. school. Yeah, but that, I think that that's the the thing with well being, or, or at least I thought like well being was for other people. Well being was for th- those who need who needed people it, like, that are ill. Yeah. Yeah, so so at no point w- was I ever sort of asked by a professional, what do you feel in this situation? How does this make you feel? And then gauged to be, to have general anxiety disorder, or yes. generalized anxiety disorder, or whatever else it may have been. Um, there was no uh, way of deciding um, or finding out, discovering what problems I was going to face in later life. That I, th- I think that at school should be a, yeah, a huge thing to be able to learn about yourself is so important and i think we we're not really taught how to do that we just think other people have problems what i have is probably just what i am um because we have no framework to sort of get yes you know get a hold and realize oh this is this, this is okay and that's why again another reason why community and unity is important because then you're more willing to yeah. discuss and because there's the whole discussion point around is mental health issues on the rise or is it that we're just talking about it more and you have some people go well back in my day we just kept it to ourselves and which is clearly and what what, what came out yeah yeah exactly (laughs) did you feel good about it like um but i think i think it's both like it is on the rise i think there is also fair discussion i don't know where i sit on the issue completely about um by discussion discussing mental health issues because it's not done just by professionals anymore it's done by you and I and other mm. people online um is there a risk that it means that people that are just worrying a bit now say oh I've got anxiety yeah. and I I think that's a fair concern to have yeah. I don't think that it's as much of a problem as some people make it out but I think it's a, a, a fair thing but by having it in the education system you wouldn't have that issue because people would yeah. understand it uh the curriculum would you know when we talk about the curriculum and what school is about school is is about setting yourself up for life it's with skills that are applicable and it's not to say you shouldn't do 
most of the subjects that are in school of course you should but learning critical thinking I know in my last two years of secondary school so when I was 17 18 you had or maybe it was just one of the years we did half an A level which was um, you either did one period which was 35 minutes a week of general studies or critical thinking oh yeah critical thinking sounded way too boring so it's like oh you just read articles and <laughs> contrast them and general studies was probably my best A level because I was really good at just chatting nonsense as might be uh, apparent today <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, but these were really interesting topics because it made you sort of do more out of the box thinking right and I think of stuff like <laughs> learning how to pay taxes or civil um was it civil studies or um y you know learning what it is to, uh, learning the role of government um and learning skills that are applicable in life as i said cooking relationships um skills you know when i was at school um sex education was the teacher the tutor embarrassingly getting a condom out and saying oh you point someone put that condom yeah, on yeah. and then like it ended up moments later floating around the room as a balloon yeah, yeah and like that was it whereas we should be talking about consent and you know relationships emotional manipulation and, and, and issues like that which are really really important and the people that seem to be on the back foot about those things saying oh yo this is just getting all too extreme i think they're people that deep down wish that they learn about it it's, it's this whole thing of i i didn't get taught it and i'm all right and 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 it's it doesn't cause harm like enlightenment yeah. doesn't cause harm um but <laughs> that's then, just the typical british stiff upper lip thing isn't it just yeah I, exactly. I think we've suffered especially in this country from from a, a lack of mental health resources and, and lack of mental health like awareness and knowledge because of that sort of the victorian period and you know anyone that went to school in those times it was it was always especially especially for males i think it was don't show your emotions it's this it's a weakness to show anything that isn't anger you're allowed to show anger if you're a lad because that's that's totally acceptable because boys are yes rough and tumble you know um but yeah i i think now we're, we're we're sort of seeing the the effects of you know centuries effectively effectively of that kind of those mannerisms and those ways of of thinking and I think because values are shifting so quickly, again, in the last 10 years, especially because of the, the evolution of technology and social media and that, people, it's going back to what we talked right at the start, it's why people want to stay in their places. People want a sense of identity that is constant, yeah. is secure. And so if we're then having discussions of like, you know, manning up, shouldn't that doesn't mean you're a man. I mean, I know, remember growing up at school feeling a bit inadequate because I wasn't, you know, into like a lot of sport and I didn't really like being laddish and mm. all this sort of stuff but I know in hindsight if we had a more accepting thing I would have been more comfortable and had a better but some people see yeah. that as a threat going but oh so you're saying that I'm my experience is invalid and it's like it's it's not and I think that's the other difficulty when we we evolve with our values is it's very easy to look back and condemn people that made mistakes in the past that weren't mistakes at the time now of course there are if someone murdered someone like and goes oh but back in my day you kind of got got away with it you know i'm not, I'm not talking and, and, and there's <laughs> actually in the me too movement there's a lot of things like it's just kind of the thing you you, you did yeah and, and it's not I, i've done a whole video about how um explanation is not equal to justification i think you can sort of say well if it was a societal norm i think the propensity for certain things to happen in the workplace was higher mm. doesn't make it right but i think we need to have an honest conversation to um you know if if people are now doing the right things and of course i'm doing this as a blanket statement there are of course if people have done criminal things no matter when it was done it should be dealt with but i think that um the shift especially in the last 10 years about lots of issues i think of like um discussions around um um trans rights and things like that that was something i had to get my head around not because i was necessarily anti-trans i've always been just cool people be who they are but in terms of like i just didn't really understand yeah it, just, it, i mean i was completely ignorant yeah to, so i think it's when there's no one in your immediate social circle that you sort of know about it's just like oh what what is that you just you and just sort of yeah and in terms of identity you it's becoming understanding of you, what your social circles are and, and where the diversity is so i remember when uh i worked at the guardian and i pitched um their, their show format comment is free which they now run with 
and it was like one proud thing I did when I was there, <laughs> even though I was there only for two years. But when I first joined and I sort of pitched the idea and I said, here are some guests we could get on the show, here are people I know. And their response to me was, it's all just um, white men. And straight away, I got, I, I didn't get defensive overtly, but straight away, I felt this sort of like tensing inside of like, I was being attacked of like, they weren't saying I was <laughs> racist or stuff like that, but it was because instantly I was like, I'm, this is who people I hang out with and I thought of, and it, there was yeah. no malice with it, but you take a deep breath, you reflect on it. And I went, you're right. It was a lack of diversity. And it's not that I have a lack of diversity of people I hang out with and that, it was just in that way. And it was a really good moment to just reflect. Yeah. And, and since then, and, and again, I think that's why the way we discuss things is important because if that had been shown to me and go, Oh, Miles, you racist? Not that they would have there, but let's just say, <laughs> oh, you're a racist. You only hang out with uh, white Straight males. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I probably, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I pro probably would have just, um, I would have had less opportunity to. Ch I, I'd like to think I would have changed, but I think I would have had less of a chance than if people. God would have been up. More. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, going back to that thing of the the knife going in, yeah, of like yeah. just feeling even more tense and anxious, and feeling like I need to huddle away yeah um and it's not and it's not to say that my peers if we write them down on a spreadsheet it should be a split equal the way <laughs> but <laughs> rules yeah but diversity is really important and i'm not just saying that as a platitude i'm saying from experience like the creates for change program i'm on that has allowed me to do like a podcast like this they have fl they flew into london uh, content creators like me from all over the world from i think like over 25 different countries and it's, it was just amazing. So I don't think there's many places, companies that have done stuff like that, even for like awards ceremonies of like international awards, just where we were actually collaboratively working on project, listening to each other's ideas. And the sort of the, the you can call it a plat, actually, the thing I came up with was I, I realized last year when it first started was that the diversity of people there l led to the diversity of experiences being shared, which eventually led to the diversity of ideas being created like I felt strengthened and enriched from that because mm. although we were diverse from our backgrounds there was a lot of commonalities um, and it wasn't that I went to it thinking oh we're not going to have anything in common I was really up for it I mean I've, the, the 12 years I've been a YouTuber I've gone around the world and I've met people from all walks of life and um, I've always thrived on that but sort of doing it over a few days it was just so inspiring and I think people that sometimes fear the idea of diversity when it's used as a platitude as in you've got to change your life to make it more diverse and and that gets into a whole other discussion about is equality about outcome or opportunity and that's a, an, a whole other discussion but i think that people look at those sort of discussions on face value and instantly pick a side they think binary are you for it or against it and for me it's just like when you talk about your experiences of meeting people from a walk's life it's it makes life way more enriching mm. and i'm sure when you've traveled around the world touring with and shikari just even though you don't necessarily get to stay in places for a, a prolonged period of time it, it, i remember growing up with that cliche phrase we're talking about platitudes all the time now but um travel broadens the mind but it really does because yeah. you it it your brain has to reconfigure and there's like now more combinations of ways of thinking and ways of attacking problems and that. Whereas if yeah. you just stay with simplicity, you're actually gonna be uh, more vulnerable to the world because if something comes out of left field, um, you're not gonna be able to deal with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the furthest I'd, I'd gone before this band was Guernsey. So I was not well-traveled. Um, so that that was a, a big shock when we started touring everywhere and uh, sort of realizing uh, f for me it was interesting because because we were playing with bands that sounded s you know similar on on many levels to us but we'd be 8000 miles away and i'd be like it it was uh, you know everything that i'd sort of grown up beginning to believe on the local scale that unity is important we're basically all the same was started to be um you know confirmed and corroborated by our, our touring life and and that's just on a, a small sort of musical scene scale but then that broadened as we we toured more met more people from all sorts of walks of life you know got the occasional day off here and there to you know speak to people outside of music and everything and yeah it just it began to just reinforce really those those early ideas about the world what place did you visit that <laughs> 
surprised you the most? And surprise could mean anything, like how good the food is. But like, was there, is there one place you look back on and you go, that really, like, you felt a real, real gear change in your way of thinking, perhaps? Or, um, I, I guess the the immediate one that springs to mind, the obvious one, would be Japan, just because that was like a slap in the face just to how different things could be, at least on the surface. Right. I've um, always wanted to go to Japan. Like, yeah. And where in Japan did you? Uh, well, you went we to a few off, places, didn't you, in Japan? Yeah, yeah. well, you, you know, the, the first few years it was just Tokyo, maybe Osaka. We've been very lucky the, the recent years to do um, with a few more sort of uh, larger tours with, with Crossfaith, for instance, a good friends of ours, Japanese band. And yeah, we got to go to Nagoya and right down to the south of the island and explore a lot more of it, which was, which was incredible. But I think just in, that initial culture so- shock of going somewhere and not seeing anything re- written in English and you're like, you're right. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's really disorientating, um, but you know th- th- there's many positives about Japan and, and man- many negatives. I think socially, but w- when you go there, the first few years it, for me it was like a a kind of paradise. It was a utopia, and everyone was so kind, um, so helpful. There's like no street crime. Um, so you know, you, so as a tourist, you walk around and you just think. This is amazing. I, I, it doesn't matter if you get lost, like which you will do because there's no, there's no in English. Yeah. Um, and you know the people don't speak great English as well. Um, but it kind of doesn't matter because if if night falls, you're not gonna get stabbed. <laughs> you're 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 not gonna get mugged. Like, it's it's incredible. Um, but then you start. You know, the the more we've gone, you go under the surface, and there's the you know the very very sexist. Um, and you know, all these other sort of right. things about it, but yeah, it's just amazing to see how different a place can be. Um, I think I think Japan hit hit me as well then, but I, I learned I took a, a lot away away from it. You've just touched um, on like again why um, shared experience is so important because there you gave like really low crime. That's a real positive thing that country does. And then you say there's issues of sexism, which yeah. is obviously bad, maybe worse than here. I, I don't know comparatively, but my point is that. So when we talk about you know nation states and national pride of like especially in America we are the best country in the world and then you get politicians saying you know what there are some countries that do certain things better than us like you know whether you're looking on the UN um, sort of listings for health or for education yeah we should learn no America does it best for example I mean that's a real cliche you don't like it you can get (laughs) right right but it's kind of like that is why um in you know global connection and empathy is so important because not just in terms of an, in, an in, individual basis if i can spit that word out but um also um in terms of policy and that is we can learn from each other's mistakes yeah. and um it's why that you know no society is perfect and it's not to give a pass of the negative things and on an individual level it's not to say that um we should give a pass when people make mistakes but it's a question of is it just about punishment and retribution or is it about learning and bringing people on side? And, I, you know, you might say it's a bit of both if we're going to be nuanced about it. But for me, it's like I, I'm really fascinated about how technology is leading to individual empowerment. And as a result, it's actually transforming the societal aspects of it as well as how countries relate to each other. And, you know, we were talking the other week about the World Cup. You and I, people that, you know, have our issues with... Um, nationalism you know and, and and we're happy to cheer on England like yeah, and yeah. it's it's not to say that there are sucked in it's not to say that nationalism is inherently bad like or, or bad all the way through there are good aspects to it it's just that ultimately it's because you were born somewhere and I think Doug Stanghope said it's uh, taking credit for all the uh, all the good stuff your country has done <laughs> and then I can't remember what the other bit was but like um just ignoring all the bad yeah but brushing it aside yeah 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 well, the, was it oh, i can't remember who said it now but like the the highest form of nationalism is internationalism now, that's when it starts to make sense to me because outside of the globe that's where our um influence ends for now well not even that because we're, st- we're still uh polluting our you know the outer atmosphere with bits of machinery and bits of uh, various rockets and spaceships and stuff um but you know soon our, our influence is, is going to travel much further but for now internationalism is just the like we said before that's just the end of the road in terms of unity in terms of empathy yes 
I just got the quote here. Doug Stanhope said, "Nationalism does not does nothing but teach you to hate people you never met and to take pride in accomplishments you had no part in." <laughs> I absolutely love it. And also, I got a quote earlier when we were talking about mental health. Um, Stephen Furtick, he said um, when we were talking about um, social media and and the impressions it has on the mind. I read this only a couple of weeks ago, and although we talk about the fear of missing out, and you know people always post the positive aspects but not the negative, and so you have these like false comparisons. I just love the way he words it. He says, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Mm-hmm. And for That's me, great. it was the, 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 the notion of behind the scenes I, I just yeah. really, really like. And so the challenge I think to all of us is not just in terms of mental health, but in terms of our imperfections is showing the world the behind the scenes, the yeah, inner yeah, workings yeah. of how we function and when we make mistakes because then other people can learn and not make those same mistakes yeah but i think the whole concern people have about not being wrong is not just about what we're talking about with status and like losing out but it's kind of um no one wants to make the first move and this happens in politics when they're debating um i I talked about it during the brexit debate and the referendum um I've done a few videos on like a, a better way to have arguments and debates and one of the things I say is I'd love there to be more intellectual honesty from both sides and so if the Brexit referendum debate was happening right now I would the first question I would say to both sides is first of all name three uh negative aspects to your proposal so the people that are for Brexit yeah, yeah, say, yeah. what are three bad things about Brexit? And for the people that are for Remain, what's three bad things about well, Remain? I'd love to see that. Yeah. They'd be stumped, wouldn't they? They, they, they would yeah. have not prepared one ounce for that. Probably question. not. And, 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 but because, by doing it that way, if they both did it, but, but, but it, that would go to the heart of the problem. If anyone concedes, the other team would then just, I'm not going to answer that because there aren't any. And it's like, even though that's intellectually <laughs> dishonest, they probably would have the upper hand because yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just... I'd love that to be a main part of, because I, I, I can talk about lots of things that I believe in and I'd happily discuss the things that I disagree, but it goes back to the whole, I'm not taking a binary side and therefore yeah. I'm not in any one camp or I'm not, well, a, I'm not a strong advocate. You know, <laughs> people want advocates for what they believe in. Yeah, oh, yeah. Miles, he's a bit, uh, you know, he, he's not fully on board. No, I'm just being. I'm trying to be honest about it. Like, yeah. so we, because if you have an, in, if you start from a position of intellectual honesty, you then build a reputation for that and then people are more willing to come to you because they know that you're not just going to overlook things. Um, but that's uh, not to say I'm perfect. Like, there's lots of things I overlook and I'm constantly trying to better myself in that way. Yeah, I, I was always very um, wary of, of of intellectual honesty and nuance because I, I sort of heard that, you know, you start out as a young, uh, you know, energised like and optimistic to the point of, naivety probably uh and usually you start out on the left possibly the far left oh my god <laughs> and um you know maybe your your inlet into politics is anarchy or something you know and um the the kind of the way that people say it usually goes is you as you get older you sort of swing back towards the center and maybe even go like quite conservative and you know once you get a family and you have you have things oh i, I, li- I like protecting what's mine yeah you start to lean to more conservative ways of thinking um so i was always i almost tried to guard myself from nuance when i was a teenager and like or or like early 20s and kind of tried to it was almost like i created my own echo chamber perhaps but now i i've swung completely the other way and i think it is it is uh another sign of like yeah i guess intellectual intellectual maturity of like saying okay you know what there are probably pros and cons to everything. That's not to say there'll be balance, like, but there'll be reasons for and against things. Um, and there will be nuance and there will be uh, reasons to rethink things over and over again. Um, and for, for me, that was just like discovering Socrates, basically, and you know, Plato's Socratic sort of reasoning. and the just... scientific method. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's, exactly it's, that. It's the case until something, there's no ego behind it. It's, yeah, you keep yeah. testing it. Yeah, it's just, yeah, so it's so important. Well, gravity is only, you know, when people say it's only a theory. So it's, it's only <laughs> just in uh, just a kind of concept that can be tested. Like, it, that was the most confusing thing growing up, I think, when you hear all these theories. And it's like, no, it, it's proven. 
yeah it's yeah just, it's just a theory up to now <laughs> um, the classic with climate change now isn't it that's it yeah um it's a great example of um cognitive dissonance and uh, yeah. uh disregard for experts and um funnily enough you know in many ways humanity is so egotistical they don't think that we're we could have a, such an impact on the planet you know <laughs> we're so great in all these ways and then it, when it comes to that it's like no you know there's been lots of change over yeah over the time immediately defer to somebody else's uh, or something else's influence yeah we have i mean we've gone through so much during this chat and so i am going to end on sort of like one key question which is with all the experiences you've had as a musician and an activist what do you feel is like your main motivation in life at the moment like what drives you every day with it because i wonder if the motivations you have as a performer like the buzz of playing live and things like that it's not that that's become less important but that's just become a part of it's it no, becomes normalized it, which right. is really weird yeah you know, to, to walk out in front of we're in festival season at the moment so we played to the biggest group we did a rock and ring german festival that league. was insane amount of people it, it's like it's just to the horizon for days yeah it's <laughs> really weird um was that really but, nerve do you get nerves from doing that or is, really. is yeah because i, was I get i get like a it's not butterflies it's not nerves it's just like a i guess it's just a, a just adrenaline just your body's prepare it's like preparing for war or something like, fight or flight against an army breath goes up yeah <laughs> you're that guy um, in the uh he used to go on horseback to the the other line of enemies with a message <laughs> and then would say like pass the message on and then yeah. come back you're just facing up against all yeah. these people except they're there to see you <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> quite quite different isn't it really um but it's weird how much it becomes normalized like in terms of i i went through for quite a few years of describing you know if someone would ask me how being on stage feels and stuff i, I you know i'd say oh yeah it's exhilarating it's you know such a surreal experience and yeah it is those things but I've started trying to become more mindful when I'm performing and it's actually nothing. I don't feel anything. Really? It's like a type of Trance? meditative bliss, oh, okay. really. It's just like, because you're so in the moment, you're so sort of just taken away with the, the situation that you're just in it. Right. Um, so that there's points now where I'm, I'm really, really sort of stand still on stage, but I'm like trying to just like, just stand and take it, take it all in and try and absorb it and go like, what am I feeling right now? Because I, I I do find it hard to describe. You know, it's like uh, what's the, the Japanese term yugen. It's just like when something is just like so intense and it, 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 you can't really verbalize it. Um, and it, it, it's like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, it, it, it is just a, a void almost, which makes it sound like a, I'm like, not enjoying it or something no, I am. It's, it's, it's kind of it's it's above enjoyment yeah so, which makes quite no, you, spiritual you, you are a part of the like, moment yeah you're like you're yeah. in it you're, it's not you going back to what you're saying at the start about how um sort of the community aspect of music it it's about collaboration uh, and although it is done with the audience and the person on stage it's actually a way of just being a part of it mm. which is definitely present in all your shows there is this dynamic you have with the audience obviously it's harder to do on bigger stages but then on you know you still get them to sing back and yeah but yeah it's just such a, a weird situation i think it's quite unnatural to be have the attention of that many people and i think that you know that's why so many musicians turn to drugs and alcohol to, to deal with it because it's just it's just fucking weird <laughs> like, <laughs> basically um, but I can't remember. What, I don't think that answers your question. What was the question? Well, it's part. Of, we, we, we're talking about like mo what motivates you now. Yeah. I mean, that is in part of it because that was like a big driving force. Well, not the reason you so necessarily did it, but it's the reason you get up in the morning. It's like, yeah, we got another great show, and of course yeah. that still comes to play. But just the evolution of you as a musician and an activist. What is? Yeah. What stage are you at now? Like when you could come to write and stuff. It, it, maybe it hasn't changed. Maybe it's just whatever the big things that inspire you now in the news or you know well, well there's there's definitely the, the central two things that i think are, are like the fuel to keep me doing this because I, I hate to be the sort of i always shy away from being the moaning rock star um but you know it does get 
pretty strenuous when you're away from home for at least half the year you're on tour of course and you know when your mental health is down and you're missing all home comforts and family but the thing the thing that keeps me going in that aspect is, is, is two things one is just the human connection um like being quite uh you know for most of my life i've been sh- sh- well kind of, kind of diffident and introverted and connecting with with people especially new people is i find quite difficult um so music was always a way of just achieving immediate connection with someone like quite deep like if someone enjoys some music that i present to them i immediately feel like i kind of know them in a way because if they're having this the same experience the same emotional uh impact uh, to the music as what i had it's like well immediately i kind of get you a bit and i feel sort of safe with you which is a big part of social anxiety um and so yeah just just connecting with people just meeting people like hearing about not even necessarily my music but just hearing about how music helps them and and getting to know people i think that it definitely is one thing that that keeps me going especially when you know there's a certain song that helped them through a hard period of their their life or some sort of hardship um that sort of makes any hardship that I have feel completely worthwhile. Um, and then the other thing that gets me up in the morning is much more selfish. It's just creating music. And I think I, anyone in any sort of creative job, when you get into that flow state and yeah. the world disappears, and same with what I was just saying, when you're on stage, everything disappears. You're you're just in that moment. You're doing that bit of creation, um, which is what effectively defines our species. Um, that That's that's certainly what i still live for that's the the you know from making music in in my bedroom with a four track tape recorder when i was like 12 <laughs> to now that that's still my my favorite thing to do to to create music so yeah i think those are the two things that keep me going that's awesome and the, and the amazing thing about <laughs> inspiration is it is bi-directional in the sense of if someone tells you that you've inspired them that inspires you to keep doing it yeah and it's like it's a good it's the best form of feedback yeah it's yeah. like it's not just a um I, I talk a lot about when it comes to making content of any kind obviously in the context of video mainly is there are sort of three main stages there's inform sorry entertain inform and inspire so entertain is of course you want to get people's attention mm. and make them feel entertained and engaged inform is the idea that you want people to leave what you've given them with more information than what they came to it with but then the most important one is inspire because if people feel entertained and informed what use are those things if they, it doesn't then inspire them to then engage with the world yeah. and improve on what they've already done and so um i definitely think those are three things you've nailed especially with Enter shikari is you know <laughs> you're doing music you inform people about issues that are for many people very out of the box um and you inspire people and like myself included we've had many conversations about that um and uh, in terms of people that are not familiar with the work of Enter Shikari, The Spark was your last album. Yeah. Is there anything you want to plug? <laughs> uh, well, we just, well, yeah, The Spark's last album came out in September. It's quite a, uh, a leap for us, really. Um, and it's gone down really well. We're, we're so happy with it. Um, that's the last bit of music. We're, we're touring um, in December onwards basically so we've got a few months of relative downtime and it just goes mad at the beginning of next year so if if you want to come and check us out live then yeah facebook twitter enter shikari.com yeah yeah yeah. classic website (laughs) seriously Rao it's really thanks so much for coming on this and uh, there's two two hours gone pretty quick yeah yeah you have to come back absolutely next week thanks for having me (laughs) yeah yeah. cheers man cool